Okay, so good evening, everyone, um, and welcome to today's BKC seminar. Thanks to everyone for joining us today. My name is Amy Maley. Um, I had briefly introduced myself last time, but I am my Copaloba's master's student here at UBC. Um, and I have here with me Maya as well, who is also our convener. So the BKC is a series of seminars for diamond geology and related topics. And our goal is to bring academics and industry professionals together. Um, I would like to acknowledge SRK Consulting, who have been a longstanding BKC partner. And I know we're all pretty well versed on Zoom at this point, but just a few housekeeping notes here. Um, please keep your microphones and cameras off during the presentation, just to make sure we've got as good of a quality of streaming as possible. The presentation will be about 50 minutes long and it will be recorded. So please keep your questions for the end, at which point I will help to facilitate a question and answer period. And then once that Q&A period is over, we'll stop recording and move on to a more informal social hour. So to introduce our speaker, um, our speaker for today is um, Yark Yakovic, who I'm happy to welcome. Yark is an SRK uh, corporate consultant and practice leader in the mining and geology group here in Vancouver. He has practiced in the mining industry since 1984. He has traveled extensively to complete studies for over 160 mining projects in 34 countries. Yark regularly leads teams in technical or operational audits, feasibility studies, bankability due diligence studies, and is a sought after member of technical review boards for operating mines. He developed early career expertise in mining of diamond deposits with De Beers, and this led to a career long professional engagements on diamond projects and producing diamond mines around the world, including Diavik Diamond Mine. Yark remains active in research development, benchmarking and operations related themes and mass mining, specifically cave mining. He has authored or co-authored numerous publications, including the large open pit guidelines and guidelines on caving mining methods. He is a world authority on cave mining, the founder of the Cave Mining Forum and received the CIM Mining Engineering Outstanding Achievement Award in mass mining. Today, Yark will be giving us an overview of historical and modern diamond mining methods. And with that, I will pass things on to him to get started. So you can share your screen there, Yarek. Okay. Can you see it? Yep. And how do I get rid of those small pictures? Uh, I think first thing what I'm going to do actually, I'm going to switch my camera off and share the screen again. Okay. Do you know how do I remove the Pictures on a side, they sort of blocking the view partially. Uh, you have one icon on the right upper corner, it's called view. And mm -hmm. then on the view, uh, uh, click and you have several options and you can have just yourself there if you want to remove everyone. Okay. Um, sharing. Yeah, we're using um, mainly Teams. Okay, but you see the screen okay, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, thanks for that uh, very stiff introduction. I didn't know that you will be reading that. Otherwise, I would uh, write some uh, inappropriate story into that. But uh, anyway, thanks for that. Um, yeah, I have, uh, I think I have about 45 slides. So it's like a one, one minute per slide. I, I will try to fly through that. So, but anytime you really want to ask questions, just, just stop me. And that mining for diamonds, um, I, I first touched the diamond mining story in 1992 when I moved from Canada to South Africa and joined the De Beers uh, in <coughs> Johannesburg in head office. And 
a year later, I moved to Botswana, where I spent five years, and I was uh, I was in charge of uh, geotechnical aspects of the the Beers mines and the Botswana mines uh, in Botswana. So when I when I got back to Canada in 1997, it was just right time and right place, of course, with all the Canadian diamonds uh, hustle and bustle. And uh, yeah, since then I've been involved and lucky to uh, to be, I think, except few like Katoka, I've been involved in all uh, mines and main mining projects. So this is really something uh, very loosely to cover. It's uh, how the mining scene worldwide looks like in diamonds and also what's the history and, and milestone, what we went through. And uh, then I'll touch, briefly on the mining methods. And uh, because <clears throat> I'm assuming lots of people on the audience are geologists, I, I had to include really some geology stuff uh, to, to bring the context into the mining. And what I choose, I choose uh, actually Ekati as a uh, sort of case example for the reason that Ekati implemented uh, four mining methods throughout the years and tested several other. And then we can chat a little bit about how the future will look like. So I start with this slide, uh, which is I always keep in mind that uh, probably one of the big bosses of diamond industry uh, made this statement. And it is, it is very true what we, what we involve with. Uh, it, it's, uh, hello, yes, this question, no. Anyway, if we look at the diamond mining worldwide, of course, they located where the diamond deposits are and it happens. And uh, there is number of uh, number of regions. Uh, and you know much more about those things than I do. Uh, but it's it's interesting that uh, that uh, when I started um, with the diamonds, with the beers, uh, there was no official Canada. There were two centers mainly, um, Russia and Southern Africa. And uh, now we'll see a few mines popped around since those those days, 30 years ago. Uh, just to just to briefly touch on the production, and I apologize. Um, um, I had a, this slide present. I presented a couple of years ago, and I didn't change, I've forgotten to change the text. So it's only one year older. Uh, Hermann Kruter helped me to update the pie chart on the left. And as you see, the, the Russia and Botswana obviously leading the pack. Uh, what was important on that text on the right is that uh, uh, the, the, the ratio between uh, underground mechanized mining, which I estimated, and it is really estimate, 10% uh, um, uh, is, is changing rapidly. And, and as you know, uh, currently, I don't think so, we actually have, uh, well, we still have A21 and Diaby yeah. finishing off, um, but the uh, rest of the Canada mines are underground, and the same is happening in Russia. Um, Africa is uh, only underground uh, with Venetia developing uh, their underground mine and and in Botswana uh, it will it, it is question of time when we're going to see that underground um, there is a there is a quiz for a geologist the largest diamond discovered so far some some of us saying uh, was not actually Kalinam was Carbonado Sergio uh, Technically, technically, few carats larger than than Kalinan. Uh, that's just uh, relevant because not far from uh, from the place where it was found is the first uh, and only so far hard rock uh, uh, diamond mine, Brauna, which we now looking and studying uh, what to do in the end of the pit life. Anyway, if we step back in the history, and it is really hard rock mining. Uh, I'm talking about. Uh, then we have to go to South Africa, to Kimberley, 
and uh, all of you know those uh, uh, famous pictures with uh, devouring those those uh, outcropping pipes uh, uh, in 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 this fashion. Uh, the, the, all the lines to individual claims and how somebody could make actually sense out of it that's that's quite remarkable in terms of logistics uh, i put a few more slides and they have kind of mining context because the one on the left those uh, those upper parts of those timberlights are typically quite weathered and uh, and the stability is an issue uh, when we go to today's mine but uh, you know there is a a uh, nice uh, context of uh, blasting damage, what we what we calling not only to the to the diamonds but to the rock itself. When you when you do drill and blast, you you send the energy into the into the rock and and uh, create uh, instability. While if you if you use uh, you know picks and hammers, uh, you you really you really do it carefully and those kimberlites, even in those weathered zones, upper weathered zones could stand up uh, pretty big, pretty pretty high faces. And uh, the one on the right side that slipped at the premiere, 100,000 tons or so, and uh, in the book note says that uh, it was cleared in 16 hours and <laughs> that's, that's hand work. Uh, I wonder how long it would take uh, today. I think it would take, uh, several days just to fly some investigator in. Uh, so those, those chaps in the olden days were, were pretty, pretty fast. Um, this was interesting one because initially I thought that they only went underground when they reached the sort of close to economic limits. This is a picture from Premier from uh, 1906 and it's, it's fairly shallow. And you already see the headgear for number three shaft at a distance. So they went underground uh, pretty early on. What's interesting also on that map, uh, uh, anybody can guess, it's an uh, open pit, obviously, of that, uh, of that kimberlite uh, being mined. But um, what's really interesting that you don't see the waste dumps. And when you look at in two days mining operations, uh, stripping ratios could run uh, easily, you know, five, ten to one, and that means ten parts of waste versus one part of kimberlite. While those so-called open pits in the olden days at Kimberley or Premier, they really have uh, next to nothing in terms of uh, waste dumps. And and uh, some of the some of the underground shots from uh, uh, from Premier. Um, they used the chambering method in those days uh, because they didn't know any, anything better. Uh, and that's not really, I think, fairly early on what I understood uh, from performance of those uh, underground mines. They realized that the kimberlite is really special, special type of rock. And some people saying it's not the rock, but uh, uh, that it weathers very rapidly and, and the strength is often being overestimated. If we step into the milestones uh, of diamond mining, uh, so obviously alluvial mining was, was done first. Um, literature said India and Yemen, I can't confirm that. <laughs> uh, but the hard rock uh, surface uh, mining went uh, in, in uh, late 19th century as we discussed um, that was uh, uh, with those uh, with those discoveries at, uh, in Kimberley region uh, very soon after that they went underground uh, perhaps another uh, milestone is the mining in Arctic in Russia later in, in Canada uh, deep sea mining in the 20th century uh, pretty technically um, challenging environment and perhaps most recently that the retreatment of the of the mine dumps which uh, produced few rich people uh, in south africa certainly and mining under the lakes uh, that's that's also not a 
not an easy task as Dayavik was pioneering uh, that, uh, that mining uh, system. If we look at the uh, open pit mining, the pit depth are excess of 800 meters. Uh, that's, that's almost a kilometer down and Zhuaneng is uh, leading the way. They know as big as, let's say, copper porphyry, uh, Chupitamata or, or similar, but they're getting pretty close and that's scary. Uh, mass underground mining, large, large tonnage, block caving and so on, uh, they they uh, approaching and some of them are near the thousand meters. So that creates the suite of problems on its own, the stress and, and uh, and seismicity, etc. Et Mining in Arctic, extreme weather environment, Canada and Russia leading the way, obviously. And as I said, deep sea mining, pretty technically challenging, over 100 meters. And then there is a big development in the processing technology as well. And I remember when diamond breakage start or damage start becoming an issue, I've been involved uh, with those studies in 1990s. Um, uh, it was pretty obvious that, uh, that the damage uh, or preventing the damage will be quite important. And those X, XRT machines and large stone recovery, we see the results at Karowe and, um, and other places. And most recently, that environmental social responsibility is also one of the milestones in the mining. When we look at the mining methods, uh, well, the primary deposits, uh, as, uh, you know, pipes and dikes and sills, they both uh, could be mined open pit and underground. And I'll focus on that uh, on that uh, uh, timberlite pipe mining and on underground because the open pit uh, is uh, is really much simpler uh, as far as I am concerned. And there you see the the uh, proportion of uh, of uh, uh, estimate what open pit are producing, but as I said, this graph is uh, based on 2017 forecast, so it would be probably 2016 data, and that certainly would uh, change. Probably, I would guess that the blue and orange uh, by now swapped. Um, so that's where we're standing now. Okay, I. The, the, when you look at the mining method selection uh, uh, criteria uh, for standard deposit, you look at the external internal geology um, uh, or body size, geometry, continuity, etc. Uh, often based on um, on economic parameters, uh, cut of grades, etc. Um, then you look at the grade distribution uh, and uh, not only within within the particular cutoff grade, but what's around it. Um, uh, rock mass competency, uh, geotechnical parameters, and then disturbances and external constraint. That's a standard uh, um, uh, criteria for, for any deposit. But on, on diamond mining, there are a couple of really uh, special areas that uh, people sometimes forget to focus. I'm not expecting that you will read it. I think we published it in that first um, Kimberlite conference here in Canada, in Victoria, or I think it's in that proceeding somewhere. But there are, there are very special areas of the uh, geology and, and mining investigation related to geology. And um, the first one probably it's the pipe size and geometry. And, and that's in uh, uh, on the surface, uh, but don't forget if you're going underground that you, you might be moving from diatrim to root zone or, or, or similar and, uh, and the complexity will increase. And uh, often those projections, the initial projections from open pit, uh, are oversimplifying the, the geometry. And then it's a real problem for underground layout to cope with that. The presence and absence of uh, pipe uh, 
uh, external and internal contact zones, what I call the disturbed, uh, fractured often, or altered rock next to the pipe as a, a process of weathering and emplacement take place, as well as inside the pipe. And especially for underground mining, that's a, that's a really important uh, aspect to, to define. Then weathering susceptibility of kibberite. Uh, and many of them with the nature of the, of the content, the clay minerals, uh, and lots of people hear about those smectites, etc. They, they really need to uh, be defined uh, pretty well with very simple methods. And lastly, uh, but not least, the diamond damage aspect, which we'll talk. So the first part, I'll just fly quickly through that, uh, I borrow uh, uh, slides from, from Dutch Okue, which is being mined now, as uh, only the BS mines currently in, in Canada, uh, 5434, very, very complex, uh, opening up uh, with that, uh, Hearn again. So you have one um, proximity uh, field of, of those pipes, but each one is different. For open pit, not so much. Uh, but if you think about if those would be mine underground, then uh, that would have a completely different context. Uh, and uh, here is the Clements uh, slide of root zone and, and, and complexity. And it was, it was so spot on uh, that uh, even some of those pipes at Ekati, not greater depth and uh, the drill hole density required to define accurately um, those shapes. Uh, it's it's something that really needs to be needs to be uh, discussed, uh, and before you engage with that uh, design of underground mine. Here is the interesting one. Um, by the way, I'll brag a little bit. That's the first three D model ever. Um, that's uh, my model when Gemcom introduced a uh, new package and I model uh, Orapa pipe in three dimensions in 19, I think it was 93. And then Matthew Field uh, create the 3D model of internal geology. Uh, so, but what it shows uh, that uh, that pipe shape, it's not only the crater, uh, you know, root zone or, or uh, uh, in that in that context, but also the the steepness, for example, of the pipe, especially for open pit mining, and as those two cross sections, one through south and north lobe, illustrates, you will be facing completely different economics because of that huge stripping you have to do for that north lobe, uh, while the south uh, lobe, which um, which uh, uh, actually confirm much closely to uh, to the proposed slope angles uh, has uh, uh, much, much less stripping of the waste. And of course, uh, dikes and sills, that's an entirely different beast. Uh, those are what I would call the 2D deposits and, and to reliably define uh, resource or, or body shape is, is, is in, in my view, impossible uh, to the degree of uh, defining the pipes. So it has a major implication for, um, you know, resource reserve statements. Uh, and that's not really uh, well captured currently because uh, there is a huge difference between the 2D deposits and, and 3D deposits. And this was great example from not far from here. And, when I was going there first time, it said, don't worry, Arek, it's a sheet of plywood and 5% uh, dilution is appropriate. And uh, well, it, it actually wasn't. And uh, that's something to, to bear in mind when you have a dikes and, and sheets to really define very well the continuity of that will require much more drilling than defining the pipe shape. Presence, absence of those contact zones I mentioned, yeah, they, they are important uh, much more for underground um, than for 
uh, for open pit. Um, and uh, I put two examples which I modeled uh, Victor a long time ago, that Premier or Alinam now, as you see, those contact zones are developed and should be part of the uh, uh, model which is used for mine design. Weathering susceptibility of the kimberlite, another characteristic we mentioned. Um, um, I, I believe I, I documented that on a core again in Orapa for the first time, and that was because uh, uh, there are two seasons in Botswana, uh, wet and dry, summer and winter, you can call it. And uh, we were drilling in a dry season, so I was uh, too lazy to pack the core. And of course, the, the rain came overnight and uh, my kimberlite, uh, many sections of that disappear. Mm -hmm. And uh, since then, I, I introduced that uh, uh, accelerating weathering test on a core samples, which is wetting and drying. And some of them are really disintegrate very rapidly. And as you see on that picture of the tunnel, the swelling pressures of those, uh, of those uh, clay minerals uh, are, are huge. I think we measured in South Africa up to 20% volumetric change uh, associated with that. So it has major implication in stability of the tunnels as well as slopes. And uh, of course, on a, on a madrash, uh, another, another phenomena, uh, uh, especially now from kimberlite mines. They also use it for, in the past, to their benefit, that so-called flooring exercises, uh, where they spread the kimberlite and let it really weather. And in some instances, they used like a steam engine to help to break the kimberlite, and then they can uh, easily liberate the diamonds. Uh, I actually run similar, a similar exercise in Orapa when we try to define what is the diamond damage uh, due to geological processes. So we didn't blast some of those crater fasci uh, kimberlite from Orapa pipe and spread it. And uh, we were wetting and drying and run the trucks over it and then processing it. So similar, similar uh, methodology. And diamond damage, some of the more important, uh, more interesting slides I took in 1996 in, in uh, Udachni uh, with a, a bucket wheel excavator just to try to do mechanical uh, mining uh, and see what the diamond breakage and damage was. I think on, uh, I've forgotten now the other one, which would be maybe Jubilee or somewhere there, they were using also Virgen uh, uh, cutter, which is illustrated on the left where uh, BHP implemented that at Fox pit. And uh, when we went there to sort of evaluate the results, uh, when they run it across, across, sorry, across those uh, uh, vast uh, exposure of the uh, Fox Kimberlite that was beautiful. It looks like a potato fields with the beautiful fragmentation and everything. But as soon as you come to the close to the contacts or when you start hitting the Granite inclusions was a big, big problem. Yeah, there, there I have a Matthew field uh, in the middle of the winter in Canada. And uh, of course, no doubt the impact on, on price could be significant. But uh, was interesting that uh, some people said, well, or not, because uh, you would cleave those large stones anyway. So <laughs> I think there were uh, two views uh, of, of that aspect, but definitely on uh, as, a, as a chips and fractures in, in, uh, in a stone, uh, it's clearly that it reduces significantly the value. Okay, so if we look at how we're doing half an hour, if you look at the open pit diamond mines, I just uh, put a list. Uh, I'm sure uh, I missed a few, but uh, that's basically uh, the list of open pit uh, diamond mines. On a picture on the left, uh, you see the mirror 
at least as it was in 1996 when I took a shot and uh, and uh, Panda on the top after finishing the, the SLR mining there, underground mining, and uh, Orapa, uh, which changed significantly since I left in 97. Uh, more interesting and where I want to focus is uh, underground diamond mining. And here is the list of uh, the one I assembled. And uh, most of them, except Gagu and Snap Lake, were actually continuation of the open pit. And I'm not including really dikes here, except that, uh, that Snap Lake sheet or sill. But uh, but as you see, there were a number of uh, mining methods used in the past. But uh, if you look at the if you look at the bulk, what we call the bulk mining methods, which is uh, either block caving or sublevel caving, those accounts uh, for majority of the mining methods uh, on the on the kimberlite pipes. So I I will focus a little bit on those and, and uh, because of the limited uh, time for this talk, I, I picked up that Ekati. But if we start with those bulk mining, block caving, Kalinan is currently, as far as I know, uh, the only mine which is, which is mined by block caving. In the past, block caving was implemented at Finch as well. Um, um, we did have block paving at Argal, which is now closed. Um, but the uh, rest is, uh, rest is sublevel caving. And uh, that's a 3D model. Uh, again, that's around, I think, 2005. I created for the C-cut design as, as uh, Kalinan was, uh, has two distinct lobes, the west and east, and has, uh, has uh, geotechnically, uh, very distinct kimberlites that very poor quality BB1 East kimberlite, very that brown one, and uh, a series of hypobiso and uh, uh, kimberlites in in the west. So the, the the mining performance of that block caving on on uh, both of those block caves was completely different. Um, there is a schematic sketch of the how the block caves looks like. And um, the important one is that there is uh, several levels and you basically that take that first upper level ahead and, uh, and drill and blast and remove that material. And once you remove enough of that material, the overlying uh, rocks are collapsing. And uh, at that point, you develop the extraction level horizon. And, and you blast like a funnels into that collapsing rock. So then the, then the mechanized machines, those LHD uh, can remove. And as you remove more material, more material collapsing on top of it. So that's the principle of, of the block caving. Um, that's the only one I, I've seen, um, I think was Vesselton. Uh, took a picture, uh, when was it? Uh, it was the diamond conference in, in Kimberley. And we went underground and that's the only uh, gravity, uh, relatively primitive, uh, very uh, labor intense, uh, non-mechanized caving process. Uh, as you see, those dimensions are very small and uh, as I said, it's a labor intensive, costly and uh, low production rates. But for those small pipes in Kimberley region, that's how they were, how they were mined. And Petra was still operating a couple of years ago, I think it was around 2017 or early on uh, that uh, gravity cave method. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about the SLC and SLR and uh, what are short for sublevel caving and sublevel retreat and many people describing uh, those those methods used here at Ekati and Diavik 
and initially at Finch and Coffee Fontaine as SLC, but uh, strictly speaking, there, there are differences. Uh, what, what we call sublevel caving, when you really caving something, and that means you have a, typically a blind deposits, uh, uh, copper porphyries or gold deposits, and, and you go to, uh, it's a top-down method, but top from the top of the deposit, not from the surface necessarily. So if it's blind deposit, which is overlaid with 100 meter or a couple hundred meter rock, which is waste, you go to that the top of the ore body and you undercut it and start caving that waste on top of it. And that illustrates that picture on the left with that uh, gray uh, caved waste on top of the uh, green ore. And uh, when, we, when we continue from open pit, uh, which is the case of uh, most uh, diamond mines, we really call talking about sublevel retreat, we don't, we don't cave anything. We blast the ore uh, all the way from the pit bottom. So it has fundamental differences. Although infrastructure is the same, layout looks the same, but a, there's a major, major difference because you don't have to cave anything. You don't have to figure out the caving hydraulic radius, you're not dealing with the uh, uh, early waste dilution, et cetera. So that's, that's the difference between SLR and SLC. And here is in a cross section, um, the sublevel paving on the left, as you see that brown uh, broken ore is a waste, which continue, which follows you uh, all the way uh, uh, to the mining horizons in uh, some sort of mixing fashion. Well, if you do sublevel retreat uh, for a large portion of that life, of the mine, you you really you really removing uh, clean ore, and only when you expose those walls of the pipe um, sufficiently, then you start getting you start getting some sloughing of the walls. And if that became uh, uh, larger than you know expected, then you switch into the sort of sublevel caving draw strategy. But again, a huge difference is between those two methods. So I choose that, uh, it's 40 minutes now, I choose that Ekati complex, mining complex, because they mine many of those kimberlite pipes and they use uh, a different mining method. And the first one, uh, which was tested, which we brought from South Africa in 1999 was that sublevel retreat, SLR. And uh, we tested it on Polar North. BHP had no experience. That was the first place in Canada introduced. So they choose that small pipe in the middle to test that method. And in fact, it wasn't even what we call sublevel retreat, but call it open benching because uh, they mark uh, everything out. So empty, empty stopes to the blue sky. And at those days, we could still walk into those into those openings and, uh, and it was spectacular to see it, that whole geometry. Um, then when they were satisfied that it works, then they introduced it in Panda. And uh, that, that was big success, despite the fact that geotechnical engineers were predicting all sorts of failure because you can see those, those uh, structures in, a, in, in the walls. And, uh, but because it is circular, uh, there is lots of confinement, and uh, none of those none of those wedges fell. So Panda was very successful in mine with that SLR method. In uh, uh, in the world, um, the Finch is the largest one, and I I took a few Google shots to the scale, and as you see, the Panda in the bottom, about 150 meters on the top of that uh, opening and 500 at Finch. So it's quite spectacular uh, to see the, uh, to see that uh, a large opening and still stable because uh, the country rock is obviously stable, but it, it's because of that semicircular um, uh, shape, which is very strong geotechnically. The Koala mine uh, was different. We couldn't introduce uh, SLR because there was a very low grade timberlite uh, 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 
part of the of the pipe, which Vittel uh, didn't drive the pit into that. So we we have to go below it, where the high grade and much more competent timberlite was, and uh, that's where we introduced the sublevel caving for that part. And uh, as you see that. Uh, uh, here is an advanced stage of sublevel caving. That's the crater, that's the, the pipe. That white uh, broken rock is actually that rock wall dilution, which is now start coming up as you as you exposing those uh, pipe walls. And because they were suffering from the uh, madrashis, uh, which is the, the water and, and uh, fine uh, kimberlite, especially from that low grade material, we introduce incline caving in the end uh, of that pipe to bring that whole makpal much more gradually. And here is some of the uh, last uh, uh, three levels. Those circles indicate where the draw points are located. And for caving, you need to uh, cover evenly that that footprint and it was very very challenging at Koala because that the shape um, uh, just like as Clements indicated in his sketches uh, changed very very dramatically and here is the interesting one again uh, for that fox pipe where the continuous miner was used but uh, uh, I think for one year or so and then they switched to drill and blast. And the question will be if uh, underground will be still uh, mined. Uh, I just excuse myself on the slide, let the cat scream in cat. Sorry about it. Um, that's the uh, that's, uh, last. A slide of the mining dikes uh, and the dikes were successfully mined mainly in South Africa uh, by a small scale operation and um, and the currently uh, there is a couple operators uh, Maya uh, namely in Sierra Leone uh, which is trying to do modern uh, much more mechanized mining of those dikes and that's where the picture of that Maya prosperity was recovered from the from the bulk sample. So the last uh, part, and we have uh, 45, 44 minutes, is the future outlook. Well, uh, that's an interesting one because uh, Herman just gave me that uh, that uh, diamond price uh, graph, and that will really drive what we're going to see in the future in terms of uh, mining mining diamonds because uh, all the all the good ones and big ones are taken at least we think uh, that they are taken and found and ex exploit so we have a second tier pipes which uh, there is quite a few of them around but uh, they didn't cut it economically um, uh, so, so the question is where those prices will go and how many of those second tier kimberlites we will be able to get. And uh, I apply very, very uh, careful calculations and, and routines to predict the price and came with the three options, the green one, the blue one, and the red one. And at this point, I really don't know which one. <laughs> Anybody can help with those would be wonderful. Uh, because uh, when I see all those predictions in, uh, in the mineral industry, uh, it's, it's pretty wild where the world is going. So it's uh, very difficult really to, to, to say where the prices goes. Um, one would think that large stones the the market in the future will still be there but for regular goods i'm not so sure uh, but what's important that it's not only the price but that we think out of the box and so uh, when we look at and i took the ziminski uh, uh, sort of prediction in the future 2040 and beyond 
yes, number of those mines, uh, say Finch, for example, and predicting to 2044 and, and Kalinan 100 plus and so on. Well, not so fast because those mining methods, underground mining methods have limits. And uh, on, the, on a sketch uh, uh, on the right, I'm illustrating that those, those uh, blue dots are actual blockade as an example. Uh, when you see the depth of the, of the block cave on the left, and uh, you see how, how we roughly the, the horizontal line is almost proxy to the time. So as, as we, as we, as we uh, stepping in time, we're getting deeper and deeper, but uh, the orange dot are projects. And as you see, they are way ahead of, of what we actually achieve. So between those two red lines is a very little uh, experience. And, and we're talking over thousand meters deep now, those three dots. And uh, there is like 20 projects, which are thousand meters. So very brave, those people who are signing off on those projects and resolution even two kilometer. And, and we know that we facing lots of issues and problems uh, stepping over that first red line. So, you know, it's a uh, pipe, pipes might be defined to those depths, but uh, certainly the mining technology and, and safety and everything else is, uh, is, uh, has limits. Nevertheless, uh, those second tier pipes, there are a couple interesting ideas. And the first one is the vertical pit drill and blast, which was first introduced uh, at Koidu in Sierra Leone. And that's a photograph of that hoist and, and vertical pit. So the, the concept is, is very attractive because you're not mining any waste, you're not doing any underground development um, and you're taking that Kimberlite, it sounds wonderful, but uh, it has its own uh, challenges. Obviously the production rates, and safety and, and stability and all those things, but nevertheless, they successfully approved the concept. And uh, currently there is at least uh, two projects which are which are taking that concept into into more advanced uh, study. The other one, which was around again for as I as I remember, uh, is the vertical cutter, the, especially the Bauer company, and uh, was successfully used for for dikes uh, for dikes in in uh, in uh, at Diavik when they construct those dikes to separate the the mining areas in the lakes, but also for uh, for bulk sampling at uh, at Tecati or at uh, at Fort Alacorn. Uh, on the right side is the test uh, um, in Sierra Leone to to mine the dikes. But uh, you know when you draw it on a piece of paper, uh, it looks wonderful. But when you actually have to implement it and uh, deal with the stability of those cut cutting areas, deal with the boulders and dilution. It's not as easy. Nevertheless, uh, it is definitely thinking out of the box and I'm sure sooner or later we'll see some, some of that uh, somewhere. But uh, it's very difficult also to look at the capital development requirements, not mentioning uh, environmental and social issues. So to bring machine like this to high Arctic and operate it successfully on a small kimberlite, so it will be always challenge, but it is something that uh, people implemented. And I think this is last slide. What are the main mining challenges? And I, I really focused on underground mining because they, they're much bigger than open pit challenges. And I think there is, uh, in South Africa, about 10 um, uh, pipes were mined by underground with some 15 plus dikes. Underground mining in Canada, about eight pipes and one sheet. In Russia, four currently. Australia, one was underground. Sierra Leone, Koidu, uh, first pipe is mined underground by SLR and a couple dikes uh, with more mechanized. But uh, out of those 25 pipes and so each one has a 
as a challenge is some of them big one as as we've seen on premature closure of Argal and and uh, segment of uh, pink diamonds disappear very quickly. Uh, Suboptimal mining method, uh, poor understanding of geology and geotechnical context, uh, optimistic assumptions, another one, but also the project execution. You, you know, you you can you can design wonderful mine, but if if you don't implement uh, uh, good controls, how a contractor will will develop it, uh, you could be facing uh, the same challenges as poorly designed mine. So, so that's I think is the last one. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I hope uh, you got some value from that. And how am I doing? Fifty minutes, so not too bad. Uh, that's all what I have for tonight. Thank you, Yark. That was really, really interesting. Um, we're going to go forward now with the question and answer period. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to just speak up or you can ask it in the chat as well. or maybe I'll go first. Um, I do have a question for you, Eric, just more of a personal one. Um, is your background in geology or is it in engineering? Yes. <laughs> uh, um, actually both, you know, I, I was educated in former Czechoslovakia and we had the different layout of those universities. And I came from what they call the technical university. So I did uh, five years, which was probably 60% geology and 40% mining. It was just uh, the program was geared for, for people who goes to the industry. So, you know, I'm in very nice position that I'm, I'm uh, misleading people. Uh, are you geologist? Yes. Are you geotechnical engineers? Yes. <laughs> mining? Yes. <laughs> so, um, I spent, I started with geology, three years in geological survey, then I was great control geologist here in Canada and up north, and when I joined the BS, I was already five years geotechnical engineer, but what I find out that, uh, you know, it's like when you open Georgius Agricola Remetallica, the guy was geologists, metallurgists, and mining engineers in one body. And I, I think, and some of, some of you I had privilege to work with uh, in audience here, is that the holistic approach is the key, that it's not the silo, it's actually understanding all those contexts and, and connections between the geology and mining. So I'm in really privileged position that I do recognize and really love geology much more than mining, to be honest. Uh, but you know, it has it has uh, nice moments as well when you when you involve in something that it's out of the box in terms of design. But I think that that connection we have to really nurture between geology and mining if we want to be successful. Thanks. Uh, it's Tom Nowitzki here. Hi, Eric. I've, hey, uh, Tom. Great, great talk. Thanks. I just have a quick question. Uh, are you? I presume you're, you, you're familiar with the, the 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 underwater mining approach that that's being looked at at CARTI. Um, yes. do, you, do you have any comments on that? Yeah. Look, uh, it wasn't only CARTI. It's it's Diavik as well. I think when they were looking at A21, what to do with that. Um, uh, and I've been involved in some of those. Uh, there are a number of uh, techniques. Uh, one is still the cutter. Uh, there are also for weaker stuff, uh, people thought that they can implement the, the dredgers. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, Tom. Um, I don't know what to, what to say because I don't know the capital. And, and logistics. What I find out, and that's 
true for investigating even those uh, much simpler surface cutters, say that uh, that bucket wheel excavator or or Bergen or underground cutters. But what I find out, it's not the people focused on cutting or actually excavation, but there is much bigger problem with logistics. And and you take, for example, if you have a Russians use quite successfully uh, those those underground cutters for infrastructure development. But when you when you go into the let's say caving or sublevel caving layout, uh, you have one machine and you might have twenty headings, and those headings could be three hundred meters apart, and that machines move move very slowly. So you see, it's not the cutting stuff; it's a, it's a, it's a logistics, and so that underwater stuff to flood the pit and then excavate. Uh, I would I would expect uh, logistical problems would be very difficult. But what I think in those uh, vertical checkerboard uh, say uh, cutting options, it's also the stability of those of those. Uh, actual cuts that you that you have to consider and what will happen if the if the boulder will roll out of the face of that of that uh, rock because because they, they will be in some sort of it's a very low stress condition obviously but there is a there is a in situ load and and if you create the free face it, it shouldn't be surprising that you will have uh, blocks or boulders or wedges uh, fallen out even that uh, that uh, drill and blast uh, uh, vertical pit at koidu eventually it wasn't the fault of the design was the fault of implementation but you know the wedge fell out and and that was the end of it so uh, tom i don't know it's a it's a refreshing thinking uh, always but i think one has to really do that back of the envelope calculation on on the on the capital and logistics of that, and that uh, that I I don't know. I don't know. Sorry, didn't answer much. No, that's that's useful. Question. Thanks. Yeah, I don't know if anybody knows at this stage, but <laughs> they're trying to figure it out anyway. Yes. Yes. No. I I know it's. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you know, as, as I said, it has, and, and this is more than anything else to really look at that uh, um, across the whole whole spectrum of, of uh, challenges there. Um, okay, yeah, thanks, the, Eric. Yeah, yeah, no. But I think, I think those uh, second tier pipes uh, will eventually, uh, at least some of them, will find a successful we, we cannot just we cannot just uh, do that uh, standard open pit it, it's quite clear unless the prices of course goes uh, really really high um, that mining that amount of waste is uh, is not sustainable for those small pipes Looks like Marty might have raised his hand. Do you have a question too? Hi, can everybody hear me? Unfortunately, Marty. Oh, yes, I'm <laughs> it. Nice to hear. Nice to speak to you again too. Uh, just a comment on uh, these remote mining methods. You're talking about trenching mm -hmm. and uh, tunnel borers. If you're thinking about mining, my my consideration is that it's a volume and you talk about logistics it's about volume they're low volume excavators and how much ore sorry for that word how much kimberlite material can you actually get to the process plant to make it viable that that's that's and then there's another delimiting factor is the pumping capacity how how high can you lift from a from a trench Yes. No. Look, yeah. as I said, that that whole holistic approach, you know, can can from and especially in our case here in Canada, from from uh, transport to Arctic uh, to paying for, you know, can can you do it three hundred sixty five days? Um, uh, the certainly scale 
uh, is, is one of the basic uh, calculation you would do, uh, the tonnage you can get and feed the plant and, and so on. But, um, you know, until, until those tests and, and uh, calculations are done, I think it's worthwhile to look at it, but we should, we should really do thorough uh, alternative analysis uh, uh, because people kind of zoom on base case and try to figure out the base case. But I think much more important or better way is to try to figure out when you're going to fall off the cliff. So, so you know, uh, when, when how, how bad things have to go and you start, you start uh, losing money. And if it is something which is easily within sensitivity, then, then you have a problem. But if you, you know, if you, if you increase your cost and double your uh, uh, logistics and whatnot, and it's still kind of okay, then, then you certainly have a good, good case. But you're right, there is that, that volume, the, the, the ability to operate in that environment is the pipe. Uh, does it look like a model or is it all irregular and have lots of granite boulders? Uh, uh, you know, what do you do with the water? Uh, yeah, the, and the other aspect is, uh, can you match a, a recovery plant to that mm, system? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's economic, yeah. Mm -hmm. Does anyone Thank else you. have a, any questions? Okay. Yeah, we'll have we'll have one uh, we'll have one interesting one, uh, and that will be uh, that will be Karoi, because uh, Karoi is uh, decided to go different way than sublevel caving and block caving. So, I'm, uh, looking forward to see the results. Uh, that method was uh, was done by the BS. Uh, what they're using uh, more or less uh, in the same shape uh, uh, on two mines. One was great success. One was pretty disastrous. Uh, again, uh, fit for the context of that uh, geology there. So we'll see. Anyway, thank you guys. If uh, anybody has more questions, don't hesitate to send an email or whatever contact. Um, okay, so I think we'll stop recording here. And then if people wanna stick around and just chat a little bit more inform informally, we can do that now too.